human beings as children we always brought up you know there's an inherent abhorrence to violence no child will ever ever there are few psychopathic ones or whatever they'll never ever you know who and kill any other living being and here or kill or torture or maim or trouble or whatever but here you have people who are doing this on a daily basis how do they do it how do they deaden their souls how do they manage to do it i don't know i think that sometimes people just the way i don't see art you know some people look at a painting and they know the intricacies of that painting we campaign very vigorously to stop this and first one then another some companies didn't listen at all and we ended up being very very aggressive in this campaign and now if you see a mannequin on television uh, or somewhere in a car commercial that's because we stopped all the animal tests for car crash across the world well, that's great uh, last question from my side have you ever felt being at personal risk for danger or harm when you went about <laughs> doing this work with people whose livelihoods were being threatened or they perceived it as being threatened were they actually you know come out very strongly against you and possibly caused you a feeling of risk danger yes absolutely um not usually uh because there is a sense of law and we are careful and our investigators take more risks than i do but there have certainly been times in slaughterhouses for example where the level of callousness is so high that your life is threatened as much as the animals and you have to be careful and poor rajashpur is here from peter india she and i were in a taxi after a demonstration against the carriage horse rides rides in mumbai and there was a riot with the carriage horse drivers trying to overturn the taxi so these things happen but you can't let them stop you until they stop you okay uh more best if you don't mind uh, cuz i know it's not very often i get a chance to share the stage with a celebrity like you so i want to make the most of it so uh, the thing is that you know uh, there are now some laws and stuff i read in the paper that animals are not been denied rights as living persons as sentient persons and they are not entitled to any of the rights what human beings are entitled to so there is some kind of a legal movement in that direction in some countries so what is your view on that i mean what is your, i mean do you when you see an animal do you really see a, a sentient being who is like how, how is the communication happen between you and the animal when you look at it in the eye well it's a fact that they're flesh and blood like us they have a heart they have eyes they have thoughts they have emotions they love they feel pain they feel fear there's no question and i did a talk about its human supremacy the idea that we think of ourselves as gods and we think of the all the other living beings as trash as rubbish that's the problem the fact is we are all the same and at some point just as people with disabilities or children have been afforded rights or women have been afforded rights gay people have been afforded rights one day all the animal kingdom will be afforded rights if we work for it okay so thank you so much i'll now uh, let you to audience and please join us thank you thank you you all very much for your patience i have some notes otherwise i'll get lost and talk to you for about 4 hours so this is called a call to action and action isn't only something that you call out on a film set it's very important in our own lives henry beston was a philosopher a very wise person he said we patronize animals for their incompleteness for their tragic fate 
of having taken a form so far below our form. And that's a mistake. Other animals should not be measured by man. In a world older and more complete than ours, they move finished and complete. They are not underlings, they are other nations, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of Earth. And that's a lesson I think is wonderful to remember because we have no idea of how much animals know. We're always finding out new facts or inspiring facts about animals. Recently, we discovered something I had no idea about is that to attract a mate or to warn of danger, the feathers on a peahen's head vibrate in sync with the tail of the peacock when he displays it. She gets his message. What did we know? Anyone who says animals are mute, animals have no voices, animals can't communicate, of course they can. The problem is we don't understand their communication. I think of Ahimsa as being like the Hippocratic Oath of first do no harm, but it has a corollary and that is prevent harm whenever you can. If Ahimsa where is the thing? Are you, can you see that at all? You can see it? It's okay. If ahimsa is only a passive part of our lives, a word, then it loses all potency. Not causing suffering is one thing, but ahimsa life is different than that. It means that we simply never shake our heads and get south closer to it. We don't leave, we don't turn our head, we move closer to it. And we do all we can to try to stop it. And just one person can help enormously. The power of the individual is extremely strong. One individual of any kind can make a difference. Can you see that? I hope you can. Look at this dear, small, hen protecting her young. Life is full of opportunities for action, so we should never have a dull moment. Here's a little video that I hope you can see of someone practicing ahimsa. It's called Breathless. The character is the musician Iggy Pop. Does anyone know Iggy Pop? No, one person. Okay, <laughs> and the singer is Nick Cave. Does anyone know Nick Cave? Three, four, five people, excellent. Okay, it's called Breathless, here it is. We have to, is there sound? I have to have sound. No point without sound. <laughs> oh. I would sing it for you, but you wouldn't want that. <sighs> no? What's going on? Well, we may come back to that. However, we'll have a problem later with things, so we have to try to fix it. Everywhere you look, 
if you look, we put Ahimsa into action. Last year, I was in Sangli, and we saw a wedding party preparing um, their band for the ceremony. The handsome groom was about to get on a white horse, but we noticed as we were admiring the horse, there was a little drop of blood coming out of the corner of the horse's mouth. So we stepped closer because we knew that something wasn't right. We lifted up the horse's mouth, his lip, and inside we found that they had a spiked bit. This is a manufactured bit with spikes going up and down it that was cutting into the roof of the animal's mouth. So we asked the groom, please not to ride this horse, to get off and to walk. So I wanted to show you a video of what we have done since then. And I don't think I can. What we've been doing is going to, taking the police and going to places where they, they hire out wedding horses. And the wedding horses are in terrible condition. It's not only the spiked bits, they often had sores, they're often malnourished, they're often in terrible shape. All things that are covered by these beautiful decorative blankets, if they're lame, the red tape is put around their legs so that nobody notices that all this is going on. Spiked bits are illegal in India. So if you see a wedding horse that has a spiked bit, you can call and get something done. And we should, because all this should go away. In old Delhi, where the bullock carts, we have something. I'm so excited. What do we got? Nothing. <laughs> we almost have something. No? All right, we'll come back. In old Delhi, where bullock carts compete with horses and heavy lorries, a rope eating into his nostrils, and you know they put that rope in with no painkiller whatsoever. They just cut through their septum. He's pulled this way and that. He's hit if he's going too slowly. They put torture devices on his neck so he can't turn his head. The traffic is honking and pulling around him at close quarters of him. So they saw him and they stopped the cart. And they wondered if there was anything that could be done. There is always, always something that can be done. This person spoke to the Bullock's owner, who is an old man. He was scraping a living. He didn't have any other way to put food on the table. So the person helped the old man get a government loan for an eco chitney so he could put all the load in that and retire the bullock. So Peter sent the bullock to a sanctuary where he's living his happy, happy life. Now, 12 other bullock cart owners have applied for eco jitneys and they're all getting them and we are getting their bullocks too. All because one person didn't think there's nothing I can do. All because one person didn't turn away, but moved closer to the suffering and did something about it. I was going to some terrible condition. But one person saw her and one person made the call and one person stayed with her until help arrived. All it took was a telephone call to get her the medical help that she needed. We must never pass by. You think so? Let's try this then.
for it is a breathless without you. I'm the fox Jesus, the rabbit, and the rabbit, and the rabbit hides beneath the ground. Glorious, defenseless without you. The sky can be done, dies away, and all the earth begins to stop to play. For you're still your heart, still your face going to shine into the moon in the world's name. Still your soul, still your mind, still the fire of love is true. And I am the breathless so that was the first video I was going to show you. And then when I said people can always do something, we should have, I don't know what that is from here. Oh, this is a, okay, this is another video. This is the, the horses. Can we hear it? Can we hear it? Okay. I think the charm of a vintage car or probably anything else which does not cause any toxic cruelties any day more than but I mean more than an animal which goes through so much just for our celebrations. It, it does torture them. You wouldn't want to do that on your wedding night. Right? Yeah. Our celebrations shouldn't begin with the torture of an animal. Yes. My name is Priyanka Randi and I got married last year in January. In fact, for pre wedding photo shoot, we had uh, we did a photo shoot on a Harley Davidson bike, which was so much more fun. My groom arrived in a very fancy vintage car. All his friends were they would like jump on and off the car, and they were really having a good time. Being strong with your partner and come up with different options, don't hurt animals. And right? strongly feel about it. So those are the wedding horses. What else have we got there? No? Oh, that's the one horned bullock who was in the accident. And. I am Srinivas. 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 I am काफी काफी कहीं कहीं ये टक्कर भी हो जाती है वहाँ से तो इसलिए न प्रेम कहीं न कुछ है परेशान ज्यादा जा रही है जब बेल का भी पहले पचास रुपये आम काम हो जाता आज दो से ढाई सौ रुपये में नेवर बनता है और अपना भी खर्चा है बच्चों का खर्चा है अब यहाँ से बनाए हमारी कोई रिश्तेदारी में कुछ देते हैं कि कोई परेशानी आएगी तो मैं भाजी के तो यहाँ तो जी भगव मर जाता है दो तीन जानवर तो हमारे मर गए यहाँ पे तीस पैंतीस हजार की यहाँ से कम यहाँ तक नहीं है जानवर कोई जानवर सारों दिन धूप में बंदा रहता है चे चौमा से हुए चे गेट मास हुए और चे झाड़े हुए कोई कोई भी तो हुए सारे उनके धूप में बंदे उम्मीद ये है कि हमारी इतनी परेशानी तो कट जाएगी बेल है जानवर है और अपुए हैं सोते ना धूप में तपेंगे हैं खाने पीने का खर्चा है जो पांच से पहले कमा दे तो हम कमाए देंगे तो उस उसमें अब बेल का खर्चा तो खत्म हो जाएगा अपना बच्चों का ही तो चलेगा उससे भी गाड़ी से बना दें चलाते रहेंगे so the the bullocks are retired and the men will have rickshaws then I was going to show you a picture of that dog that was, found, no, no, was found on the street there he is can you imagine that people went past this dog every day and did nothing and yet there was something anybody could have done? So one group of animals who need our help 
are, believe it or not, mother cows. They're worshipped in theory, only in theory. Here they are. We praise them as mothers, the best mothers, yet they're not allowed to be mothers because people grow up thinking they, human beings, need the cow's milk, and we definitely don't. And we grow up wanting milk, despite knowing the link nowadays of the A1C to cancers of the colon and the breast. We want it despite knowing that there's pus in it that interferes with our digestion because people get addicted to it and they say such ridiculous things as, oh no, I must have my curd, I must have my milk. We're grown up, we don't have to say things like that. And because we don't discipline ourselves, cows are denied the right to be mothers Dairies take their beloved children away so that the milk given by God or given by nature for that calf is sold in the stores for human beings who don't need it. Their need versus human greed. But if we move closer to a cow's suffering, we see that she's not a milk machine. She's a thinking, feeling, living being just like us, an individual so smart that she can use her horns to operate a village water pump just by watching. Yes? No? No, we missed a bit. She can open a gate with her tongue just by figuring it out from watching other people do it. That is not an object that is a living being. In fact, behaviorists have discovered that cows use very subtle facial and eye movements to express themselves. Again, we think they can't talk. What do they know? But they do. It's just that we don't see. I'm going to show you a little video by an Australian star who had a baby and has taken an ahimsa approach to milk. Becoming a mother has made me very aware of the fact that I'm an animal. I think motherhood is an animal instinct experience and the idea of someone taking my baby away from me and taking my milk for their purposes is unthinkable. I once was on a holiday near a dairy farm and there was this noise coming from the dairy farm 24 hours a day while I was there and I asked my host why are they making this awful noise and she said oh they've just taken the calves away and these cows were calling for their babies um, for days the whole week that I was there all through the night. Breastfeeding is a wonderful bond that you can share with your baby. A dairy cow doesn't have the choice of whether or not she can breastfeed her baby because her baby is taken away at birth. She has these breasts, these arteries full of milk for her baby and she can't feed her baby. And that would be incredibly painful, both physically and emotionally. I'm vegan because I think kindness makes you happy and veganism is the greatest act of unconditional kindness that you can do. For me, it's about animals and not ours. This notion that we have of dominion over the animal kingdom, I think needs updating. They are not here for us, they are here for their own lives. Order your vegan starter kit now at peter.org.au. Can you hear that in the back? Yes, okay. So, Dr. John McDougall, who is a world-renowned wow. nutritionist, says something on his radio shows that has always struck me as important. He says, why do we drink, why have we chosen to drink cow's milk? He always says, why isn't it giraffe milk? Is it just there aren't enough giraffes? Or why isn't it pigeon milk? 
or why isn't it some other milk? Why is it cow's milk? So I want to show you a little video from the UK that makes that point. Or not. <laughs> New dairy product being launched. Hi, come in and take a seat. Thanks for coming. So this is a focus group for a new dairy brand. Would you like to try new milk? Give it a try. Can I taste it? Yeah, 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 it's for you. Tell me what you think. Have a taste. Tastes kind of sweet. Yeah. Sweet. Well, just the milk is not. White. It's whiter than white. This is a smooth. It's like a milkshake, basically. What's smooth? That's regular cow's milk. That's regular cow's milk. That's dog's milk. What? Fuck me. What do you mean that's dog's milk? Dog milk? Milk for dogs. Why are you give me? I bring dog milk. Do you mean that this is produced by a dog? You should have said that first. I'm watching dog milk now. Dog milk. Instead of cow milk. Yes. <laughs> Shame. Milk from dogs. Would you ever drink that man? Yes. 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 Would you drink it? You know there's pus in cow's milk. Oh, like, pus, yeah. like pus, like uh, stuff you get from boils. Oh my god, are you kidding? Yeah. No. Mm. There will be a big advertising campaign that will explain all of this. Don't use that picture. <laughs> it's disgusting. Are you being serious? Make sense? So another area where we need to take action is the use of animals in experimentation. Some otherwise good people cut up animals in their medical training because they think it has to be done and it does not. Nothing that violates our ethical beliefs ever has to be done. It is a hemsic to say no. If one student objects, then always other students join them. And all use of animals in medical training, as we've seen in the US, as we've seen in Europe, stops. At Harvard, one medical student said years ago, there must be a better way. I won't do this. And now they use simulators that breathe, that die, and you can cut them up and put them back together again. They're computer programs and they work much more beautifully than any animal that is put in the trash when they're killed. Good people achieve so much. Because of their support, Peter has stopped baby mother monkey deprivation experiments. We have stopped food ingredient tests on dogs and rats. And that doesn't mean they're fed the food. They are gavaged with the food and then they're cut open. We have stopped many toxicity poisoning experiments on dogs. We've stopped all experiments on chimpanzees, including space experiments on chimpanzees. We have closed laboratories and we have liberated hundreds of animals who are going to die in them. Today, we employ scientists who once did use animals themselves, but who took a closer look at what they were doing at the harm and decided to work to end animal experiments. They help laboratories switch to human organs on a chip, human organs like lungs and kidneys on a computer chip. And they, remember the simulators at Harvard? Well, they can be used again and again. And Peter has now donated simulators to 27 countries around the world to end the use of animals in medical training. Terrible things still go on, of course, all over the world. Right here in India, we have horses who are repeatedly injected with snake venom to make antitoxins and spider venom to make antitoxins for international drug companies. The horses are covered in sores and they're very thin. Are we showing that now? Okay. So 
have done now, we are in year two of a three-year funded study to have human and synthetic antitoxins that will replace the use of all these courses in pharmaceutical antitoxin studies. Thank you. Another place that we need to look at closely is leather production. In China, we have investigated and found dogs being bludgeoned to death to make collar trim for jackets, toys for cats, women's gloves, and men's work gloves. They're in, exported all over the world, but of course they're not marked dog leather. So if someone only cares about dogs, then don't buy any leather because you never know. Cows too even for people who don't eat them, commonly end up being made into leather shoes, leather jackets, leather couches, briefcases in other parts of the world and re-imported into India. And all the animals who are used for leather, the cattle, the sheep, the rabbits, the goats, even the crocodiles that are made into bags and the ostriches and the ducks whose feathers are used for bedding and for jacket filler, all of them are also their bodies end up being sold as food. So leather and wool and down and cashmere and angora and mohair are not anything that an ethical person wants to be part of. Even the smallest of animals deserves our consideration and our protection. I chose snails, for example. If a snail comes across a dead snail, do you know that they leave as quickly as possible? Just like us, it freaks them out. And if someone takes a snail even five kilometers away from where they live, no matter how long it takes them, that snail will make his way home. They remember everything from where a food dish was put by a person who cared for them. And they don't hear human voices or sounds the way we do. They recognize sounds from vibrations, but they know enough that they will withdraw into their shell if a stranger comes along and they will open up and look up if there's someone they recognize, this giant they recognize who has been kind to them and has put a favorite food down. And you hear of dogs and elephants who anticipate a tsunami and they run away. They know it's coming before we do. Snails have been seen climbing up trees and climbing up the sides of walls two days before a river flooded. So they have senses that we either once had and lost or never have had. I'm ashamed to tell you that when I was a little girl, I ate snails. I lived in France, I ate snails, and it turns out that snails were the very first animals I stopped eating, but that's a different story. Other small animals are clever too. Here's a little video about a squirrel. This little guy's been working for about 15 minutes and I hit the lid on tight because I didn't want to make it easy. So now you see him, he's about to, he's thinking about giving up. But one more try here. 
and you see him actually start turning the lid. And then once he realizes, he takes hold of it, unscrews it, and watch this. grabs the lid, runs to the neighbor's yard and hides it, and it <laughs> comes back for his reward. Very smart. And so a seagull smart. Here's a little video about a seagull. noted it is only the hand of human tyranny that rejects the proposition that consideration for others must extend beyond the human being we're not asking that animals get the right to vote although particularly in the United States they might have done a better job than human beings all we're asking is that they simply be allowed the right the simple right not to be harmed needlessly and not to be slaughtered for a coat, a snack, an experiment, or to make us giggle. All animals depend on us to act, to stop if we see suffering, always to educate other people. It's wonderful if we change ourselves, if we become the kinds of people we expect ourselves to be, but more importantly, we have to grow this. We have to open other people's hearts and minds and eyes so that they see how powerful they are. So please, educate your friends, educate your family, educate people at work. Take some of the stacks of materials on these stalls. Take them home with you. They're not just for you and me. They're for the people out there who didn't come to this festival. Please buy only cruelty-free Ahimsa toiletries and cosmetics. When someone is having a wedding or they're having a baby shower or something, a birthday, please give cruelty-free presents so they can see what's available. Please post our videos on social media and tell politicians, even if you think you are talking to a brick wall, tell politicians what you want to change last night in delhi i met a minister who has just helped pass a bill that is banning manja the kite string that cuts up birds and children bless his heart so let's use our sources let's use the bumper stickers on our cars on our bikes on our laptops when we're sitting in a coffee shop and everyone can read that bumper sticker on the open laptop. Let's put stickers on meat and dairy packages for people who only care about dogs or so they think. Let's hand out and leave leaflets everywhere. You can find me by the trail of leaflets that I leave. They're in the back of the airplane seat pocket, they're on the bus, they're at the gym, wherever. Direct and please direct challenge anyone. Great sense. Stop a bullet cart. Get help for street dogs. Do everything that you can. And a Himsa world can happen, but only 
if we make it happen. Here's how. Let's cultivate our empathy. Let's appreciate animal consciousness. Activate ourselves for change. Participate in protests. Advocate for the rights of our fellow living beings. Agitate for a kinder world. Alleviate all the suffering we can ameliorate whatever pain we see and liberate the oppressed. Let's not annihilate, exterminate, asphyxiate, liquidate, exsanguinate, decapitate, mutilate, mutate, violate, lacerate, or humiliate. Let's never hesitate to tell the truth to others or circumnavigate the fact because it's more comfortable for us not to raise the issue. Let's not equivocate, but stand strong. Let's not prevaricate because we're afraid to take action. Let's not negate our responsibilities to all living beings. Let's emancipate, let's elevate, let's educate, facilitate, and activate our own personal potential to change the world. Let's make animal liberation a vital part of all of our lives. Not a hobby, not a tea party, but an integral part of what we do every single day. And we will get the kind of world that we want. I'm going to leave you with this video from the famous rapper Riza. Who knows Riza? Oh, it's getting better. Getting 11. Riza from the Wu-Tang Clan. We are all the same in all the ways that matter. It doesn't matter what we look like, how old we are, what language we speak, or who we love. It doesn't matter if we have fur or feathers or fins, the length of our nose or the number of legs. We're not different in any important way. We all have thoughts and feelings. We all feel love and pain and loneliness and joy. We can all understand, but we are not always understanding. We experience ourselves as separate from the rest, but none of us deserves to be treated with less respect. Our task must be to break free from prejudice and to see ourselves in everyone else. Thank you and good luck in everything you do. Our resources are your resources. Anything you want, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Uh, if nothing else, it's a lesson in English language and literature and the ability to use words which will instill, inspire. I, I, I don't have the words. <laughs> she has them. Thank you so much, Ingrid. I request Rajika to come and give a small memento. Thank you for coming. Uh, if this is small, I want to see the big gift. Next time. Huge. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. So you cannot, uh, you know, step away from Ingrid's talk without feeling touched at some level. Anyway. <clears throat> okay, if we now uh, we go in for the last session of the day. And uh, this is also a very interesting topic because, you know, uh, it has been ingrained into our head that people who eat plant-based diets and people who eat vegan food or forget vegan and vegetarian food, they're not strong. They cannot do, you know, hard work. They cannot do athletic work. Yeah, okay. So... And if you want to be a sportsman, if you want to be a performer, if you want to be an athlete, you have to eat meat because meat is what gives you strength. So this is a myth 
which has been perpetuated for a long, long time. And everybody says, if you don't eat meat, where are you going to get your protein from? Where are you going to get your strength from? How are you going to build your muscles? And you know, you can't, you can't perform any sport or any activity at the highest level. But like everything else, there's a myth too. And we would like to present to you a group of people who are actually doing the most extraordinary things, achieving the most extraordinary physical endurance events, and they're doing all of that on a vegan diet. So I'd like to introduce, uh, we have a small discussion. Uh, Kuntal, is Kuntal around? Okay. Uh, can somebody outside call Kuntal in, please? No, I have to change the setting. Change the setting. Not there. Setting change the setting. He's right outside. He's right outside. <laughs> So Kuntal is going to talk about life as a vegan fitness athlete. And uh, no, it's coming. Okay. So uh, Kuntal Joyshar is an engineer by profession, a mountaineer by passion, and a vegan by compassion. In late 2002, Kuntal Joyshar decided to go on a vegan diet after he connected the dots that there's no difference between a glass of milk, <coughs> a block of cheese, or whether matter a piece of meat. Sometime in 2009, he discovered the calling of his life, to climb the very top of Mount Everest. <coughs> after seven years of physical and mental training, fitness training, two failed attempts, mind you, twice he could not do it, but he didn't give up. Due to natural disasters, he could not complete the summit. But after the third time, he finally stood on the very top of Mount Everest on May 19th, 2016. And he proved that climbing <coughs> big mountains or the tallest mountain in the world is very much possible on a vegan diet. So I would request Kuntal to come on stage and along with him, the other panelists, we have uh, Dharmendra Kumar, who's an ultra marathon athlete. Is he around Dharmendra? Yeah, no. please come on, Dharmir. Uh, Siddharth Sukla, uh, Ironman triathlete. Oh, yeah. 